Let me go ahead and uh, click record. Okay, anytime you're ready. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today, Dr. Elaine Doherty. Uh, Dr. Elaine has been in the um, KHP department, Kinesiology and Health Promotion Department uh, for over 30 years. And uh, I've been lucky to know her for the 19 years that I've been here. <laughs> Um, Elaine is, has made huge contribution to the, to, to the department. Um, she teaches classes related to stress management, emotional resilience, um, health and well-being, uh, yoga and meditation, um, and has had a, a huge impact on, on our students through, through teaching of those courses. Uh, she's, um, was a, a primary driver in creating the Mind Heart Lab and providing spaces for students to de-stress, meditate, um, and lots of other things. Um, but it's an amazing space um, that really, um, again, makes a difference in, in students' lives. And, uh, um, and other things that she's done, uh, submitting, submitting a grant to create um, an app related to stress management. Uh, she's recently uh, um, co-authored a, a new class, an upper division class um, focused on emotional resilience. In, in terms of her research, um, has published uh, several books uh, related to this work. Um, which again, um, I think has the potential to really make a difference in, in, in people's lives. Um, uh, personal note, uh, uh, Elaine is an avid runner. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I usually manage to get her on my step challenge team and she leads the way every single time. And she has two awesome dogs, uh, which we all love in, in KHP. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's my, my, uh, extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Elaine today. And, um, it's, it's, uh, going to be an amazing talk and we're, uh, we're all so glad that you were able to join us today and we'll pass it over to Dr. Elaine. Uh, thanks Laura for that very, uh, Nice introduction. Um, I am in the lab right now. One of the things about a psychophysiology lab is it can't look like a lab or it doesn't really function well as a psychophysiology lab. So when we call it the lab, it really is a, a, a space designed for emotional health and resilience. And one of the other things that I just want to add um, to what Dr. Chase said is that one of the reasons I do what I do is um, there was a point in my life where I really struggled with my own mental health. I had serious anxiety and um, panic attacks. And, and at that time, I was teaching all kinds of classes around physical wellness, physical health and wellness, and um, was really struggling emotionally. And so I wanted to really know what it meant to look to find a, an integrated way of well-being and so a lot of what i talk about um is you know and then i then i went back to school and got my phd all focused in this stuff so although i do bring an academic focus into it and i love the science behind it it is it was um, originally promoted by uh, a personal journey because i know where those struggles come from and i know what those struggles feel like and sometimes i forgot i forget to say that because once my i remember a student in my class says i, I want to know if you do this stuff and i thought oh my gosh i and made it through the last 15 years without this stuff. So, um, so that's where I'm coming from with this. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, talk about, we're gonna, this is, as you're gonna hear, it, gratitude has to be ex an experience for it to be effective. And our whole idea today was to really provide some content on the science of gratitude, but also really, you know, have it be um, a, a an experience of gratitude before we lead, lead into the Thanksgiving holiday. So I am going to talk pretty fast through the content. Don't feel like you need to retain every piece of information. We are gonna make the PowerPoint and the Zoom available if you wanna go back because I do wanna really get into the experience and we are really kind of um, shorter on time today. One of the things I wanna start out with though is the idea that I don't fall apart at the sound of helicopters anymore. 
And to me, that's an absolute miracle. Um, got this little <laughs> That sound right there used to just send me into an absolute, absolute uh, panic. And I was, it was actually after I knew all of this stuff. Um, I got that phone call that no parent ever, ever wants to get. And um, my son had a freak accident and fell into a window, not out of, but into a window. But as he did that, the window, a shard of the window cut um, a big part of his arm, including his brachial artery, and he almost immediately bled to death and uh, went straight into surgery. Um, and we didn't know if he was gonna live through the, the night. And what happened was I was not at home. He was 15 years old. He was fine to be home alone and he was just running through the house. And I got that phone call. And in that phone call, um, it's my other son, he's fallen apart and he's like, mom, he's okay. And I don't know why they say he's okay when he's not okay. So they're just gonna put him on the ambulance. And of course, and he, my other son's just falling apart. And, um, and then he said, oh wait, no, they're gonna put him on a helicopter. And at that point, I just knew that this was not a good situation. And so um, he made it, I need to say this, he did make it through the, <laughs> through the surgery. He has some limitations for his arm, but it's an absolute miracle that he's alive. And it's an absolute miracle that he has an arm. For those of you that are interested in kinesiology and physiology, uh, he didn't have a pulse in that arm for seven hours. So it's an absolute miracle that he is uh, alive because he lost so much blood. And anyway, so he's, he's fine. Um, but that experience was so ingrained in me that every time I heard a helicopter, even before I was consciously aware I was hearing a helicopter, I would start just panicking. And this is after I knew this stuff. So it wasn't like being able to talk myself. I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> I just couldn't seem to stop it. And, and it really, honestly, it was a serious, serious practice of gratitude that changed that all for me. I still hear a hot helicopter before anybody and you'd be surprised how many helicopters fly above Cal Poly. Um, but now I am absolutely awash with a feeling of gratitude um, when they come over me. And, and, and again, it took a lot of work to do that. So I'm gonna talk about kind of how that whole process um, works. Um, but before we start, we need to just kind of say, what is gratitude, right? What is gratitude? Gratitude and the way that it's defined in research is a feeling or a state of being grateful. And that's really important to understand that it's that feeling aspect because it's an embodied feeling. And that the idea that it's an embodied feeling is the thing that gives us the blueprint of what makes effective grat um, gratitude practice as opposed to ineffective gratitude practice because there is something that is ineffective gratitude practice. Um, it's also defined as like, it can be due to a specific act that somebody does for you or just kind of a, a really general sense of appreciation. So all of that is kind of how we're defining gratitude in the research. Um, what, does, what does the research say about gratitude? That uh, the practice of gratitude makes you a, more alive, energetic and enthusiastic, more determined, attentive and alert, gives you increased vitality, resilient in the face of trauma, lower cortisol. Cortisol is our primary stress hormone. It's the thing that wreaks havoc in our body when our fear response system is in control. And, um, and gratitude actually lowers cortisol. It increases oxytocin. Oxytocin is our primary ho hormone that's responsible for connection for reduced feelings of loneliness, for love and for bonding. And when oxytocin is high, cortisol is low. Um, it, we see fewer symptoms of depression with people that practice gratitude. We see increased psychological, social, and spiritual resources. <laughs> I love this one. People that practice gratitude exercise more regularly. And really what that is, is about is there, there's a whole host of research around how people will exercise more self-care when they also practice gratitude. Um, uh, people that practice gratitude feel better about life as a whole. 
gratitude practice activates parts of the brain that are associated with feelings of connectedness. Uh, gratitude practice is a, is a predictor of healthy relationships. Uh, one of the things that has shown over and over and over again, which was actually kind of a surprise, is that it cuts down on feelings of loneliness. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So, so the question is, gratitude, really, I mean, it's like overwhelming when you look at all the research of the positive effects of gratitude. It does change everything. But <laughs> it may be really far from what you're feeling right now, right? We've been through a really challenging time. We're full of stress. The headlines are unrelenting about everything that's going on. We're, you know, worried about how we're making it in this virtual world and overwhelmed with school. We have all kinds of conflicting feelings coming up. The, the far reachings, uh, reach, <laughs> reaches of COVID and, and all the implications around that. Our, our own mental health and the way it's suffering and the way that we see ourselves because our normal systems of support aren't really there as much, or we may just be angry, <laughs> angry at all of this stuff. Um, and again, the, the feeling and the isolation of not having the same relationships and, and being able to communicate, being able to see in the same way, being able to be in relationship with people in the same way um, is huge. So one of the things that's really important to understand about gratitude is it can't be faked, it can't be forced. Gratitude, and this is when it comes back to an embodied feeling, it's not a cognitive process. It has to be an embodied feeling because the other really important line of research is that it shows that if it's done out of a sense of indebtedness or ambivalence, the positive effects are mitigated. So in other words, if you, you're doing it with, with other presenting emotional states that are alive in you, then the feeling of the gratitude doesn't, doesn't work, right? So, and I'm gonna get more into what that means. Um, so what is ambivalence, right? It's conflicted attitudes. And so when we have conflicting emotional experiences, the one that's more dominant is the one that's going to train us, train our capacities for that. So if we're trying to force ourselves into a state of gratitude, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, I love this picture because it's like, you know, we're going one way, but really what's going on underneath the surface is something else. And so gratitude doesn't work when it's something else that's going on underneath the surface. So what would happen? Some, sometimes when people practice gratitude, they feel conflicted. They feel like I should be grateful, but I'm really not, right? Or it's a perfunctory thing. You know, I know a lot of people that they're going to keep their gratitude list and every night they're going to write things, you know, 10 things that they're gratitude, that they're grateful for, but they're really not feeling it because it's more of this duty that they've got to do it every night, right? Sometimes we feel more indebted. Somebody does something for us and we may think we want to be grateful but there's also this conflicting feel of oh gosh I'm really indebted because that was too much or we might really feel unworthy of something that somebody does for us and these are really honest emotional states and we need to be honest with what's coming up for us for gratitude to be to work and so what what it, it, it just can't be forced or faked. And if other emotional states are coming up, those are important to recognize and deal with. And at the same time, um, maybe that's not the thing that you want to work on with your gratitude practice. In other words, I had, you know, I was, am, am really, really grateful to a family that, really nurtured me when I was growing up. My, my siblings are all much older than I, and so my family kind of grew up before I did. And there was, a, there was a family that took me in that really was helpful and nurturing me. And, and for a long time, I, I knew I felt grateful, but I also felt really unworthy of that. And I had to work through that feeling of unworthiness before I could really, really focus on that sensation of gratitude. So, um, so for great gratitude to really work, we can kind of look at the psychophysiology of it all because that kind of gives us an answer. 
the human system that we live in is this, this whole mind body complex. It filters every experience, everything that's going on. And we carry a physiological imprint of every moment of every day. And so this is what I call the spiral of becoming. We have a perception and then, and this goes on in a split second. And the minute, the, the second we have a perception, we have meanings that go along with that perception. And one of the things that I need to say about this is about 80 to 90% of this is subconscious. We're just going through life and, and, and feeling certain ways, and we really don't know this is going on. Um, and the BRC here is behaviors and reactions and choices. So at any point, we're behaving and reacting and having choices of where we are with this spiral. But the minute we make meaning, and again, this may be going on beyond our awareness, a lot of the meaning making process in our brain is subconscious, it's about beyond our awareness. But we immediately have a physiological imprint of that meaning. And so we have three different systems that I talk about a lot, the neural, the neural systems in our body, our electrical systems in our body, our biochemical systems in our body carry an imprint of every experience of every moment. And the more they carry that imprint, the better they get at it. It's like exercise, right? The more we do it or learning a bike or learning, learning to ride a bike or learning a math problem, the more we do it, the more the whole systems of our body get capable of doing that. Our emotional states are no different. And so, and then the big arrow here is that always goes back and affects our perception. So, um, so again, we are adaptive beings. We are absolutely adaptive beings. So every moment of every day, um, our body, whole mind-body complex is filtering our experience. Um, it carries a physiological imprint. That imprint dictates how we perceive the world at the moment. So that's what we call functional changes. And then the more we're in any physiological state, we actually get better at maintaining that state. So we create a capacity for more of the same. And those are structural changes. We actually see structural changes in our whole mind-body complex, including the neural networks in our brain, including our whole biochemical systems that actually change over time and, and it, it actually structurally change. So we become a different person and, and change our capacities for certain things. And we basically have two dominant drives. We have a fear response drive and we have a calm and connection drive and they function very differently. We can't be in both states at once. Um, and whatever state we're in is the state that begins to be dominant. And so um, gratitude helps us go from our fear response state into the state of calm and connection. And what, whichever state we're in, we see the whole world from that state. Um, so the, again, whether we're in our fear response drive or where, whether we're in our calm and connection drive, they're, they're, they're two distinctly physiologically different states. And we can only be in one at a time. We can shift but we can really only be in one at a time because they're kind of off, opposite biochemical states. The neural networks are, are functioning very differently. And the one that we're in the most is the one that creates the capacity to live from that drive. So let's bring this back to gratitude. For gratitude to be affected, it has to be an authentic experience. If there's another presenting emotion, if there's an emotion of feeling indebted or feeling like, oh my gosh, I got to write my gratitude, you know, words today, or I got to do my gratitude journal or, or, you know, I'm really feeling unworthy or I just don't feel like to, if there's another stronger presenting emotion, that's what we're creating the capacity more of, right? So our emotional states can't be forced. Um, and whatever authentic emotional state we're experiencing is the state that becomes that, that um, physiological imprint that we get better at. So for gratitude practice to be effective, it has to be authentic. It has to be authentic. So forcing yourself to, to think positive when you don't or forcing yourself to write the words, it doesn't work. It has to be your mind body complex molds to your authentic experience. And it has to be felt in an embodied sense. Gratitude isn't a cognitive exercise. It has to be felt because the, the emotions that are felt 
in our whole mind-body complex is the thing that begins to create our capacities for more of those. So what does that mean? <laughs> um, how, how do we, so again, you have something called neuroplasticity, which means that the neurons in your brain actually change to your repeated experience. So how does that work in gratitude? In gratitude, it's, it's far, far more effective to do smaller things that are really going to create that state rather than try to write a whole bunch of things, right? Some people think, oh, I got to, you know, I have to write 50 things or I got to write something new every day. And it's not, a, again, it's not about the cognitive process. It's about the authentic experience, right? And so I had a student once that was just in a place and she's like, I can't even think anything that I'm grateful for. And for some reason, a purple crayon came up for her. She didn't even know where that came from. It wasn't about the purple crayon book. Um, and, but she just started with that. And so what happens is when you can start with something small that's really authentic, the neural nets in your brain actually get stronger and create more connections and then begin to widen. And when, the, when they widen, then you actually you have associative memory, which actually then creates your capacity to see more, right? So it's much more effective if you just start small with something that's really true for you and just focus on creating that experience. <laughs> And then your body naturally adapts to make you more capable of that experience. And, and then doing this over and over again engages with your common connection system. When your common connection system is dominant, we see psychologically, you see more opportunity, you see more possibility. When your fear response system is dominant, you see restriction, you don't see answers. And so, um, and then we also have something called the broaden and build theory. And that what that is, is that when you are in your common connection system, you see more possibility and then you act on that possibility. And then again, it strengthens those neural networks and widens those neural networks and the way they function. And it's a, it's a small uh, or a, a very kind of methodical, slow process that creates it completely changes the capacity of um, of your emotional states. Okay, so for me, again, so what happened with that helicopter is um, I knew I was having a stress reaction every time I heard it. And, you know, you'll, you'll see me, if you ever see me, if you're walking across Cal Poly and you see me like staring up at the sky, it's because I'm looking at a helicopter. People always like, what are you doing? And you'd be just like shocked at how many um, fly over. I'm like, what is this? But then I realize they're always because they park at Benelli Park. So, um, so for me, it just, I knew what was going on, but it wasn't appropriate that I was having a panic attack every time I heard a helicopter. And again, a lot of times this, this starts subconsciously. I didn't, wouldn't even know what was going on. So it was like, okay, so what's true? Well, the, what's really true is the helicopter saved your kid's life. And so it was a really, it wasn't immediate, but it was a really conscious process that every time I heard that helicopter, I would shift into the state of gratitude, right? Instead of panic. Now, this is a really singular experience. It doesn't have to be as, um, you know, as, as drastic as the story I'm telling around there. And, and when you shift to something that you're grateful for, it doesn't even need to be about that thing. Right? You can shift into anything that you're grateful for and just shifting in the moment changes your whole mind body complex. But for me in the helicopter, every time I heard a helicopter, I would stop and I would take a few breaths. I would ground myself and I would really be able to bring up that sensation of gratitude. Um, and it, you know, I had to start small, <laughs> but doing it over and over and over again. Now I can honestly, honestly say that I still hear a helicopter before anybody, but it, I am awash with, with gratitude. Now it's, it's like, oh my gosh, something feels so good. And then I realize, oh, I'm hearing a helicopter. And again, that's a really singular experience. But so how do we do these gratitude practices, right? So a new twist, I'm gonna give you a couple different things that we're gonna do, and then I'm, we're gonna do a quick writing activity, and then I'm gonna lead you through a, um, a meditation 
Um, the new twist on the gratitude journal. So what is a gratitude journal? A lot of people um, keep a gratitude journal and it's, you know, it's kind of what it sounds like where you just uh, write journal about something that you're grateful for. Where people get into this ambivalence or, or the, the states that don't work is that they feel like they need to write about something. I should. If there's a should before gratitude, it's probably not effective. Or I've got to write about something different every day. Or, you know, I've got to write about this and I've got to write about this. And, I've, and, and that's, it's not, if it's perfunctory, if other feelings are coming up, it's not going to work. So what's the better twist on the gratitude journal? Pick one thing. Pick one thing that you're really grateful for. And not one thing that you think you should feel grateful for, right? That you really are, because it's more about creating the experience. When you want to do gratitude practice, it's, it's about creating that authentic experience, not about forcing yourself to feel grateful for everything that you're really not, <laughs> right? It's, it's about really creating that authentic experience and then what happens is is when you create that authentic experience then you get more capable of feeling more gratitude around other things in your life but it can't be forced to begin with so the new twist is just write about one thing i have students sometimes that, that you know they, they keep they do a gratitude journal for the project in in class and they say well i'm right right running out of things to write about it doesn't matter <laughs> it's not about the things that you write about. It's about the feeling. So you could write about the same thing every day. It's more about the experience that you're creating. I mean, I still do this. I, I, I always write, you know, journal, keep my own gratitude journal because it's so helpful for me. And I am often, often, often writing about the same things. It doesn't matter. Again, it's not the thing that's important. It's the experience that's important because you mold to the experience. So again, it's not a cognitive process. It's not forcing yourself. It's not feeling, you know, I'm perfunctory. I've got to do this. It's really about creating an authentic experience for you. Um, and so I have a few practices that I um, kind of encourage people to do. We're going to do one of them in a minute. Um, one is that I call every, everyday gratitude. And that's kind of what I was doing with the helicopter, where you can pause in any moment of any day and just pause and, and let yourself pull up a feeling of gratitude. Right, and, and everything changes in that moment. Your biochemistry changes, your neural nets change, um, your heart rate variability, which is a measurement of your emotion changes. And the more that you change that physiological imprint, you know, um, the, the better you get at that. So just by stopping and pausing in different point, points of the day, it breaks the normal chain <laughs> of, of reactivity that we're going through typically all day long, every day. And it just breaks that chain, but then it also begins to cultivate a different way of being. Um, and so you can just, you know, you, you can pause in, 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 in many moments as you have in a day. And the more that you pause, the more that you're creating your systems. You know, I think one of the things that's, for me is so helpful coming from a kinesiology background is it's practice. It is practice. And we know that the more that we do anything, the better we get at that thing, right? So gratitude is a practice. And the more that you can stop in all the moments of your day and just bring it. And again, it's not about forcing yourself. It's about find, finding something small, you know, appreciate a flower or appreciate going for a walk with your dogs or, you know, whatever it is, just to be able to stop and pause. And then the other thing is to be able to really have a sustained feeling of gratitude. And that's what we're going to work on in a minute. So if you have um, something to write with, what I'd like you to do is um, get out something to write with. We're just going to write for maybe, I don't know, three or four minutes. And what I'd like you to do is just really pick something, not that you think you should feel grateful for, but something that just for you right now carries a true experience of gratitude, right? And again, the, the criteria is that it is authentic and that it, it really does kind of bring up an embodied sense. 
So if you would just kind of brainstorm and write about that, and then we're gonna use that as we go through a meditation. So just about one more minute. So find a comfortable stopping space and just get into a, like a comfortable seating position. I'm just gonna lead you through a really brief guided meditation on gratitude. And um, so again, it's important to be comfortable and also um, there's a lot of physiological things that I do when I lead a meditation because there's some things that you can do with your body that naturally calm down your brain. So what I'd like you to do is just bring, bring your awareness to your breath. And just let your awareness and your breath meet somewhere in your torso that feels very comfortable for you to focus on your breath. It's not a controlled breath, it's just very natural. If you want, you can repeat the word release on the out breath and just physically feel the sensation of release. And then bring your awareness to your eyes and let go of all the stress and tension through all the tiny little muscles all through your eyes. Those muscles are directly connected to your emotional system. So if you can let go of those tiny little muscles, it sends an automatic message to just to your brain to just calm down. So just release your eyes. And then release through your face, all the tiny little muscles all through your face. Almost feels like you're losing your expression. And then release through your shoulders. And again, let your awareness in your breath meet in a focal point in your torso that feels comfortable for you. And just extend your out breath just a little longer than your in breath.
Again, it's not a controlled breath. Physically feeling the sensations of release. I want you to think of something that you really feel grateful for just at this moment. Could be the thing you just wrote about. If something else comes up that wants your attention, focus on that. But really feel the physical sensation of what that gratitude feels like through your whole body. Physically feel the sensation and paying attention to detail for some people helps. So if you're holding an image, just really focus in on what it is about that image, person, place, or thing. And just really let yourself just immerse yourself in the experience of feeling that gratitude. I'm just gonna leave you quiet for a few minutes, but what I'd like you to do is just really focus on the sensation of the feeling and if an image is helping you bring up that feeling, notice what it is about that image. Just immerse yourself in the feeling. And if it feels comfortable to do so, just cultivate a tiny little smile it doesn't feel comfortable, don't do it. But if it feels comfortable, just cultivate a tiny little smile. It's like you're trying to bathe every cell in your body in the sensation of gratitude. Bathe every cell in your body in the sensation of gratitude.
Just physically feeling the sensation of release. And immersing yourself with that felt sensation. And if an image helps to bring up the sensation, really focus in on the details of the image. We're just gonna linger just for a few moments more. So I want you to feel like you're just cementing this feeling in your body. And just notice how you feel. So it's really important to kind of come out of the meditation or guided experience really slow. So just, it's almost now like you're, you're staying in the meditation, but you just want to bring a little awareness to how you feel. And then just a little more awareness to how you feel. And then just a little more awareness to how you feel, but also now just kind of move your fingers and your toes a little bit and very slowly come out. But again, it's just really important to make that transition. When you transition slow like that, it actually hooks the parts of your brain together so you can more easily access this state in your waking moments. So you just kind of want to come out and reflect and kind of observe how you're feeling. Okay, so how are we doing? Does anybody have any questions or anything? It'd be best if you would unmute yourself instead of the chat because I have a hard time checking. Does anybody have want to share any experience or? Is it normal to have tears? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't happen every time. But a lot of times that comes up, we're so not used to letting ourselves go to places like that. So um, it, it's not, it, yeah, it, it, it's not uncommon. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a good thing. I mean, it, it shows that you're really kind of able to feel that. So. So we have a question, where will the recording be posted? Um, Dan will better answer that. Um, so if anybody has any other questions um, and then Dan can answer the, where the recording or, or comments, if anybody's willing to share your experience, I know we're kind of getting close out of time, but if you have any questions or you wanna share your experience or how, how y'all feeling? You okay? <laughs> yeah. Usually, when people come, go, who is somebody was going to say so. Oh, I was just saying yes, I'm okay, but I did have quite a few tears come down. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The video will be on 
the College of Science YouTube channel. I'm going to put the link in the chat right now. Okay, so yeah, so the link is in the chat. And if you, um, if you, uh, I think you could just save your, your chat and, and then you'll be able to get that link. Does anybody have any, this call? <laughs> <laughs> so, so all the gratitude practices are in my book. I always have to laugh at this because that picture wasn't taken all that long ago, but it's pre-COVID hair. It's like a foot short. <laughs> it's now, it always cracks me up. You can always tell how long COVID's been by looking at other people's hair. Um, so yeah, so, um, but it has, uh, the, the book has all the practices, the gratitude practices in it. Does anybody have any other questions or? Yeah, I, I have a question. What uh -huh. is the, um, I've, I've heard that there's benefits to doing this in groups. Is that something you've got experience with or can comment on? Um, so yes, there's a, a great experience of doing uh, any kind of practice in a group. It doesn't have to be done um, that way, but there's something about kind of the energy of the group experience that is some people just love. We, we have during normal times, we actually have a guided meditation group every um, Thursday at noon. We used to have them live in the lab itself. And it was just the energy that's created in that group was really amazing. So yeah, I, I am really um, supportive of group activities and, and it doesn't have to be done like that, but yeah, absolutely. There's just something about that shared shared experience and, and the shared energy of the group. Well, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Anybody else have any um, any questions or? Um, yeah. So is it third? Yes. So absolutely. Um, we, yeah. Let's see. Um, if you would like to. To be included in the Thursday meditation group. If you want to either leave your email here or you can email me, um, then I can get you on the list. That, that meditation group is open to anybody and it's it's amazing group. It's actually led by um, a, a few monks from a group called Peace Point Meditation. And it's it's a really, it's a, it's a great group and we've really kind of grown so. <laughs> Okay, let me. Um, okay, thank you very much. That. So I, yeah. So does if anybody else has any questions or comments or. Okay. I put your email in the chat there. Okay, yeah. So you can either email me or I'll take the ones I'm saving the chat. So anybody that wants to put that in the group, um, you can just take mine too. Okay, well, we know that some people have uh, other classes or, or uh, yeah. events to go to, so I'm going to go ahead. And